<laughs> That's the basic premise behind the smash hit franchise Jurassic Park. Probably. Start off as a novel by Michael Crichton, and then adapted into a movie by Steven Spielberg, Jurassic Park told the story of an island-based theme park full of dinosaurs, a group of scientists, some kids, and a lawyer who go to check it out before opening day. All the dinosaurs break loose, and there's implications of trying to play God, and blah blah blah. You all know this stuff. It's Jurassic Park, man. I can't be the first person to tell you this movie exists. And if I am, well, go watch it. Duh. But of course, you've already seen it. Everybody knows this property. Even 20 plus years after its initial release, this name still means something. Jurassic World released in 2015 and was the highest grossing movie of that year, only to be dethroned by the revived Star Wars franchise that winter. And it's still like, I think like the fourth highest grossing movie of all time? That's bananas. Whoever thought a T-Rex could go toe to toe with Darth Vader in terms of popularity? Well, me for starters, because Jurassic Park was my Star Wars. As a young kid in 1993, there was simply nothing else like this movie. My jaw dropped the first time a dinosaur walked onto the screen. It looked so real. My heart broke at the sight of the sick Triceratops, and then it stopped with the appearance of the T-Rex. And then the raptors, well, well, they just became the coolest damn thing that ever existed, even though they are voiced by tortoise X. I, I'm serious, that's one of the noises they make. Over the years, there has been a wealth of behind the scenes content detailing how the effects team created the revolutionary look of the dinosaurs using a combination of CGI and practical effects. Here's some info we didn't know though. The dinosaur sound effects were created with animal sex sounds. For example, velociraptors emit sounds of turtle love. Jurassic Park sound designer Gary Ridstrom says, quote, it's somewhat embarrassing, but when the raptors bark at each other to communicate, it's a tortoise having sex. Despite the dangers of Isla Nublar, this was one theme park I desperately wanted a vacation to. And thanks to video games, I had plenty of opportunities to do just that. Welcome to The Game Apologist, where we look for the good in bad games. I'm Nick, and I'll be your tour guide as we excavate all these digital adventures of the past. Now we've already tackled a couple different types of games on the show, but we have yet to touch on a rather notorious type of video game, the licensed game, and more specifically, the movie tie-in game. What are those? Well, before mobile phones became what they are today, it was rather common to find a video game based off a big budget movie to promote said movie and make some extra cash. But why are these normally considered bad? Well, budget and time constraints mostly. When a game exists to help promote a movie, normally they're handed off to a cheaper development team with a very limited amount of money and time to work with. They have to release while the movie is still relevant, and most of the time they're not even given the script. But the producers couldn't care less. The games aren't the main focus, so obviously quality is not a top priority, and it shows in the final product. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you not only get one good game, but a whole slew of them such is the case with Jurassic Park. So let's not waste any more time. We've got a lot of games to cover. Because a neat thing about Jurassic Park compared to a lot of other movies was the fact that it made a unique game for every single game console available at the time, with a couple of exceptions, but we'll get to that. Instead of leaving the development duties to one team, they'd get very different developers who would make a crater full of very different games. And there were a lot of consoles to develop for. And just to be clear, we're not going to be covering the pinball table or the arcade game. I'm not really sure how to capture the footage, but it was awesome. If you were somehow near a functioning movie theater Jurassic Park arcade cabinet, give it a whirl. Game's a lot of fun. Now, today we're going to be sticking with the console games, so let's get started with the Nintendo games. These are the most similar games of the set. Given to Ocean for development duties, they created a Jurassic Park game for all three of Nintendo's platforms of the day. The NES, the Game Boy, and the Super Nintendo. Let's start with the NES game, which puts you in the shoes of Alan Grant and has you exploring the island from a bird's eye perspective. The game is broken into levels where you're collecting eggs, key cards, river rafting, and saving stupid kids from being eaten by... Why would you be in the t-rex enclosure who looked at that sign and says oh perfect they'll never find me here oh 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 that's that's probably that's probably why is that how the t-rex hunts oh my god no wonder it went extinct for a late nes game the lack of a map or save feature is a bit of a pain in the ass and they aren't kidding around with those question mark boxes you honestly have no idea what's going to be in there they'll either give you health or kill you Thanks game, glad I have to gamble every single time I need health. It can be hard, downright unfair, as these older games tend to be. And truthfully, I never beat this game as a kid. But I remember always having a good time when I played it. Even today, while I'm not the biggest fan of overhead action games, this still plays nicely. The map 
map layout isn't perfect, but I have a lot of fun exploring and blasting raptors all the same. You're probably going to be smacked around a bit if this is your first time playing, but once you get the general idea of where things are, really, you're going to have an hour or two with this game at the most. That's just how it is with most older games. Once you have the lay of the land, you really won't be sinking that much time into it. And I've heard that this game actually takes more from the Jurassic Park book, as you explore stuff never shown in the movie. I haven't read the book since I was a kid, so I can't really say for myself, but if that is the case, that's cool as hell. And it certainly makes me more inclined to go back and read the book. Or just use audible.com. That's right, just sign on to Audible and use the offer code I don't have any sponsorship because I'm a nobody. The Game Boy game is basically the same but portable. Man, actually, I thought this was really cool as a kid. I'm sure this happened way more often than I was aware, but I rarely got a carbon copy of one of my console games in portable form. So it was really cool seeing this game on the go. Now, there are some slight changes between this and the console counterpart, but nothing of real note here. Well, outside of the massive change to the T-Rex encounter, which, as far as I can tell, is the only game to use that vision is based off movement bullcrap. It's a little uh, frustrating, but I, I thought it was kind of cool. The Super Nintendo game, at first glance, seems like a prettier version of the NES and Game Boy games. There are plenty of similarities, the overhead play style, egg collecting, even a lot of the same weapons, but this is more of a poor man's link to the past meets a diet doom. Interesting playstyle combination, but not as refined as either game it takes inspiration from. You get all of the island right from the start, but, well, kind of. You have to unlock gated off portions, but it's essentially one map. This unfortunately makes the lack of navigation tools or a save function even more effective here, but if you're playing this game in the modern age, well, there are very easy solutions to those problems. So let's not keep griping about that. Having all of Isla Nublar to explore was really cool and very intimidating. Because unlike the NES version, where the likes of the Tyrannosaur are relegated to a boss fight, in this game, you could just be strolling along your merry way and oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. You also get these neato first person segments every time you go into a building. Very primitive by today's standards, but very cool back in 93. There was always something so creepy about these portions. Granted, they became a lot less creepy once you had a rocket launcher. Now, I would recommend taking a guide along with this game, but if you're up for a bit of exploring, it's a lot of fun. Just keep in mind, this game isn't great at telling you where to go or what to do to win. Hell, I've never beaten it myself, but I had a lot of fun picking this game back up for this video, and I fully intend to finally complete my adventure on the Super Nintendo. The SNES version, in my opinion, is easily the best of the three Nintendo games, but I have to tell you, all three were a blast to play again. And if you're a fan of game music, give these titles a listen. Wonderfully catchy. Because that's why we love Jurassic Park. That dope-ass dino beat. And strangely enough, this game actually got a sequel. Jurassic Park 2, The Chaos Continues. This was a little confusing back in the day since there was a long wait between Jurassic Park and its sequel, Lost World. I was really confused as a kid. Was this based off a sequel I hadn't heard about? Was this the title? What's going on here? Well, it did turn out to be anything like that. It was just another excuse to keep the franchise relevant between the movies. And it came in the form of a hard as hell side-scrolling shooter. Absolutely nothing like the first game, but it still plays pretty well. I actually like this animated look, especially the impressive opening cutscene. Looks like an adaptation for a Saturday morning cartoon version of Jurassic Park, which, let's be real, had to be in talks at some point. Anyway, nice to see some visual variance between these games. It's not perfect. You'll be spending a lot of time just shooting and slowly creeping ahead because you know that an enemy's just right off screen and this game gives you very little time to react, which can be a problem because if you blast too many dinos that aren't the Rex or Raptors, you may very well cause a second extinction for these animals. That counter up there indicates how many dinosaurs are left on the island. Blast too many and the park can't open again. Or I guess ever because it didn't the first time and this doesn't really seem like a good idea. Why are we here again? But I have to admit, I found this extra layer of challenge somewhat clever. A couple of the other games gave you some non-lethal options for the dinosaurs, but absolutely no reason to use it. Why would you give a raptor a little nap? 
just so we can get back up all refreshed and ready to kill you all over again. Way easier to just send it back to the Stone Age. In this game, you have to conserve these creatures best you can and not let that counter get too low. But even that isn't a problem if you're patient, as the number will start to rise after a while. Life, uh, finds a way. Ah. Also, this is a completely needless gripe, but I don't know where else I'm going to say anything about it. This generic action figure you're playing is apparently Alan Grant. The, uh... <laughs> Okay, whatever. Not too surprising. Did you see what they packed with the actual action figures? Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs are on the loose again. Now Grant's armed to the teeth and Malcolm's loaded with weapons. And while we're on pointless nitpicks, I hate fighting other humans. Don't get me wrong, it plays as you'd expect, but I'm here for the dinosaurs, man. Let me blow up a T-Rex. Oh my god, they actually let you do that. To be completely honest with you, this game is incredibly frustrating, especially if you're jumping in for the first time. But again, I have to commend the ambition here. The art style is nice, the animation is smooth, controls are responsive, you could do a lot worse. And Chaos Continues also continues on the Game Boy. Here it has also made the transition into side-scrolling. It's much cuter. I think it stars a stubby Alan Grant. I mean, he's got his hat on this time at least. It's got dinosaur boss fights. You still collect key cards instead of uh, eggs. I don't know. I mean, they just kind of plop in front of you. It's a pretty run-of-the-mill platformer, but it's confidently built. I do enjoy the exploration of the other games, but this one has a lot less to complain about. It's a competent shooter and platforming game. And yeah, you still have to collect stuff, but you never have to go too far out of your way to get what you need. It's never really maze-like, so the aimless running around of the other games isn't a problem here. And like I said, it had dinosaur boss fights, which is badass. And hey, the theme from the original NES and Game Boy versions are also here. That's a nice touch. And that's it for the Nintendo games. But Ocean, as I discovered while making this video, actually had yet another version of this game on the Amiga and DOS systems. And that's this game. Being my first time playing this wasn't doing too well. And this is probably the weakest game we're gonna be covering today. This is more of what I expect when playing movie tie-in games. Somewhat random enemy placement, the game just expects you to know how to do things, a lot of tedious time wasting, that, and the game completely shifts over to a first person shooter segment in the second half of the game for no real reason at all. These inconsistent design choices are found everywhere in this game. I can go on for a bit, but the fact of the matter is, objectively, this is not a good game. This whole game's a mess, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything worthwhile. I really like how it looks, and that young dino dork in me gets excited seeing animals that I never got to see in the movie. And while the first person stuff kind of sucks, I've always had a soft spot for old school 3D gaming. It's kind of like seeing an official Jurassic Park Doom game, just not good. I don't know what the differences are between the Amiga and DOS versions, and I'm not going to pretend to know much about gaming on these since I didn't grow up with any of this stuff, but personally, I had a lot of fun discovering a Jurassic Park game. I never knew existed. And while we're talking about weird, bad Jurassic Park games on nonsense game machines, let's talk about Jurassic Park Interactive for the 3DO, which is... Hmm, where to begin? All right, so this is basically a bunch of lazy mini games and it kind of sucks. What kid on earth thinks of crap like this when they think of Jurassic Park? This version gets a lot of flack and for good reason. Nonsense mini games with no relevance to the franchise, knockoff actors, <laughs> why did they even bother? Look at these people, look how miserable they are. Not like in terror or you know anything that requires acting, just sheer boredom. This is quite possibly the most shallow gameplay experience of the entire lot of games we're looking at today. And well, well, this is the Game Apologist, and this is indeed a bad game, so let's find something good about it. With gaming where it's at today, it's hard to see some of that same appeal one would have had in 1993, but even in 2017, and this being my first time playing the game, I gotta tell you guys, I kinda love it. Honestly, for what this is, I really don't mind the game. They actually do a decent job justifying these strange minigames, namely by making you a security guard trying to hack into the park systems. And if you're familiar with the movie and Nedry with his annoying computer hacks, then you can see the inspiration here. They played up the computer lockout nonsense from the film real hard. And as goofy as that lockout screen was in the film, I can see how the developers could see Nedry spreading out that weirdness in everything he programmed. And having to conquer a computer virus by playing a boring but admittedly complex minigame seemed right up his alley. The main segments where you're confronted by one of the three predators aren't bad either. Bare bones, sure, but as a kid, this variety would have kept me more than entertained. You tase Dilophosaurus, not deep but very cathartic. You get chased down by a T-Rex, again easy stuff but still fittingly stressful, and the perspective isn't bad. I like that you only get a glimpse of this monster thanks to the rear view 
Sliding Mirror. And the first person raptor segments? Creeps me right the hell out. This would have been unplayable to me as a kid. I was a total wimp. Any game with long, dark hallways? No thanks. And if the raptor gets you? Ugh. Now I can understand if you look at this and just roll your eyes, but whatever, this was impressive for 93. And again, I know I'm a sucker for early 3D graphics, but I really like how this thing looks. I was not expecting to like a mini game collection as much as I did with this game. That's the power of dinosaurs for you. Okay, we got Nintendo out of the way, we got the weird nonsense consoles nobody bought out of the way. Let's take a look at the other big chunk of Jurassic Park games provided by Sega. Here's the Game Gear version. I didn't grow up with this myself, but I knew it existed thanks to ads, and I wanted to play it so badly. Now I finally got the chance as an adult, and I gotta tell you, it's not bad. It took me a minute to get the hang of everything I could do, since I didn't have a manual and I was too lazy to look up anything on Google, but I got the hang of things relatively quickly. So you pick a section of the island and start off each level in a vehicle, where you blast the ever-living hell out of everything that gets near you. You can earn health upgrades and extra lives for the level ahead if your aim is true, and you'll have to fight against a boss dinosaur. But whether or not you win the encounter, you will then be dropped off into a more traditional platforming and shooting segment. This is somewhat generic, but considering the limitations of the machine, it's pretty impressive. You only have three weapons to work with, but you can select them at any time. And while the movement feels a little stiff, there's actually a wide variety of things you can do. You can latch onto overhanging branches or poles, shoot stuff, and well, I mean, that's about it, but it plays fine. The Game Gear version, like I said, is a pretty traditional shooting platforming game, but man, it's got dinosaur boss fights. That's awesome. Let's move on to Jurassic Park for the Sega Genesis. This was the version I easily spent the most time with growing up, and as such, this is my favorite of the entire set of games we're looking at today. Playing it now, I can easily understand if you'd prefer the gameplay of the Super Nintendo version, or yeah, even the portables. The platforming is rough, requiring far too many leaps of faith, and the layout of the levels is just hideous at times. The controls are stiff and slow, likely due to all the effort put into animating these extremely detailed sprites. I'm not gonna pretend I know anything about game development, but you can clearly see where the priority of this game is. But despite the flaws, I still absolutely adore this game. As a child, I wasn't nitpicking every single game I came across. I was in it for the dinosaurs. If you can make them look badass, that's all I needed. And look at these dinosaurs. Between this and the Sonic games, I simply did not believe people when they told me that the Sega Genesis was weaker compared to the SNES. I mean, how could it be? Blue Sky worked closely with the actual animators of the film itself and created some of the most stunning dinosaur sprites of the day. I mean, look at that Triceratops. Hey, buddy. Oh, oh, crap. The developers also gave the dinosaurs dynamic AI, meaning they'd be doing something different every single time you played, which actually explains a lot of confusion and tense moments in my childhood. And look at that T-Rex sprite. Good God. That thing is terrifying. I love it. The gameplay is not perfect, but it is manageable. It does take a lot of getting used to, and the platforming isn't super great, you're probably gonna die a lot, and there are no checkpoints, which can be very tedious. But there is a password system, levels aren't too long, and there are a lot of great moments in this game. But even after I thought I had all the enjoyment I could possibly get from this game, one fateful day, I finally decided to dick around with the other options, and to my immense surprise, discovered this. They let you take control of a Velociraptor. I freaked out. I get to play the best dinosaur ever? Are you kidding me? I'm sure it was advertised on the box, but I had no idea. This was a wonderful surprise for me. I spent so long playing as Alan Grant and had a lot of great fun with that, and blah, blah, blah. But now I get to play as one of the scariest parts of the adventure and get to chase down that bastard myself. The raptor feels so good after playing the wimpy little human. You can Mario the crap out of other animals, eat the compies for extra health, kill the crap out of park employees, jump stupid high. God, this is so cool. So yeah, maybe Jurassic Park on the Genesis isn't a perfect game, but there's a lot of genuine effort and creativity here. And you get to play a freaking raptor, which is just the best thing ever. And the Genesis version of Jurassic Park would also get its own sequel, called Rampage Edition. As a kid, I had no idea this was its own unique game. Didn't have a two in a title or anything like that. Thought this was just the same Genesis game with some tweaks. But I loved that game, so I asked for this for a birthday or a Christmas or something. And when I got it, I was in for another surprise. This was a full-on sequel. Rampage Edition is much more action-oriented. I mean, just look at this player select screen. Alan's gone from paleontologist to goddamn Rambo. And the quieter gameplay is just out the door, as dinosaurs will literally fling themselves at you. Oh my, it doesn't even have a jumping animation. It's just throwing sprites at me. This game doesn't even pretend like you sedate animals. Grant's just straight up killing them, even with tranquilizer darts. And like any good game, they blink right the hell out of existence
existence once they're dead. They also added these thick black outlines to the characters, because, I don't know, I guess it's easy to get lost in all the chaos? Eh, I don't know. Gameplay's still not perfect, but it does feel a little bit better compared to the first game. The four life system is back, so you better sort out this island with just this, otherwise it's back to the start of the game. Even with these limitations, game's not that hard. I haven't played this since I was a kid, and I made it to the final stage without too many problems. They don't really tell you how to deal with the T-Rex in the final stage, so of course... Uh... And of course, the raptor's back. Raptor's awesome. Raptor can somersault into a double jump. Never mind any of my other complaints. This game is perfect. Now, you think the fun would stop here, but they actually went out of their way to make another Jurassic Park game for the Sega CD. I wasn't kidding when I said they made a game for everything available at the time. You ever watch Jurassic Park and think to yourself, man, this would make for a fantastic mist-like point-and-click adventure game? No? Well, they did it anyway. And they're real proud of it, too. It has a making of featurette and everything. You need a particular kind of patience and mindset for games like this. One that, unfortunately, I've never had myself. So I can't speak to how well this game works as a point-and-click adventure game. I keep stressing that navigation can be a pain for a lot of these games, but this game takes it to a whole new level. Which is crazy considering you only have single-screen backgrounds to deal with. But I've always managed to get lost and confused very quickly when playing this game. The Sega CD version doles out random tools to help you solve some very vague clues to work your way through this adventure. Some feel clever, most feel nonsensical, and along the way you'll get some dinosaur facts. Which is fun. Isn't that fun? I had no idea what the hell I was doing when I was a kid, but I still found this game very intriguing and very intimidating. Partially because the perspective made me feel like a raptor could jump out at any second and I couldn't do a thing about it. And partially because this game made me feel like a complete idiot. But it did have great ambiance for the day. For the limited capabilities I had to work with, I was always tense exploring the island. This game feels ambitious. It feels like it was doing its best to immerse you in this dangerous world, even though it was constrained to this CD add-on to a 16-bit gaming console. Hell, all of these games feel ambitious. Even the worst of the worst feels like they were trying to do something new. Something different. Universal understood they had something big on their hands with Jurassic Park, and spared no expense with these games. And yeah, we did have dinosaur games back then, sure. Probably more than I'm remembering, but most kinda sucked. And they only featured like three or four generic species. Or dinosaurs were just relegated to a single theme level of a game that really had nothing to do with dinosaurs. Jurassic Park filled that void, and not only set a new bar for movies, but for licensed games as well. When it came to dinosaurs, Jurassic Park wanted to be the name you thought of, regardless of the medium you enjoyed these prehistoric creatures. And I feel like the care shows. I mean, just look at these toys. This is a generic dinosaur dinosaur toy. And this is a Jurassic Park dinosaur toy. This property wanted to elevate itself above everything dinosaur related. Movies, toys, and yes, video games. So many of these developers set up to make something just as memorable as the movie it was based on. And in many cases, they're still great to play all these years later. These games could have so easily just been added to the ever-growing pile of crap license games. And these titles are just the ones that came out around the first Jurassic Park movie. There are still way more games to cover, and they get way more interesting than this. And yeah, the games aren't perfect, but hell, the movie isn't either. I mean, look at these animals. They were supposed to be the most lifelike interpretations of these creatures we had ever seen, and they blatantly ignore well-known facts about these animals. The Dilophosaurus was a tall, late Jurassic carnivore, and in the movie it's this teeny little hopping squeak toy that sprays poison and does this lizard frill rattlesnake crap. Dinosaurs didn't spit poison? Why isn't being a dinosaur enough? And that's not a Velociraptor. That's possibly Deinonychus. Maybe a short Utah Raptor. Somewhere in between, but it's one of those two. Velociraptors were angry little turkeys, and the T-Rex could see just fine. Don't move. Can't see us if we don't move. And even if its eyes didn't work, why can't it just smell them? And on top of all of this, there isn't a single feather on any of these creatures. Their relation to birds is not a recent discovery. The movie itself even talks about how they were more closely related to birds than they were reptiles. I know a lot of dino nerds became annoyed at the liberties the novel and the movie took with these animals, but that's not exactly a new thing when it comes to Hollywood. And if you watch these films and just assume that there was a squeaking, poison-spewing, frilly lizard hopping around the earth at some point, well, I recommend reconsidering taking entertainment for fact and do a little bit of reading, because that's what little second grade Nick did after watching this movie. I didn't know what a raptor was before this film, and now the Deinonychus is my favorite dinosaur because of it. They took the liberties because it made the narrative more exciting. Velociraptors are called as such because it's a much more badass name. I mean, the nickname alone is worth it, just doesn't work as well with a Deinonychus. You bred cusses? 
nah, it doesn't work. And the Rex can't see moving prey just so they could add a buffer to its power, allowing Alan and the kids to be right next to this thing without being immediately gobbled down. And it made for one hell of a tense scene, arguably one of the most memorable scenes in film history. And the Dilophosaurus is so radically different from the real thing because the Rex and Raptor already fill a particular challenge for our protagonists. The more human-sized, agile, and intelligent Raptors provided a more personal kind of terror. I mean, look at those sneering, evil faces. These were the villains of the movie, not Nedry. They didn't look hungry. They just looked like they wanted to murder the crap out of children. The T-Rex, on the other hand, couldn't care less. It was just this giant, powerful force of nature that would wreck anything that got in its way. If they had a normal Dilophosaurus, it would have just been this boring middle ground between the two other animals. So they changed it to this deceptively cute creature that had this terrifying transformation and a unique attack. And really, nothing it does is completely out of the ordinary for real animals. There are plenty of creatures who spit venom or frill out to become even more imposing. So I guess they at least took some sensible liberties with these animals. And none of the dinosaurs have feathers because nobody's afraid of giant birds. I'm sure you can make that design work, but this is how we saw dinosaurs for generations. Scales look badass. And honestly, this is probably much easier to render in CG. You gotta remember, this was 1993. There were a lot of little design tricks to make these animals look as good as they did. And I guarantee having static scales helped with the process. And on top of all this, all of these liberties and designs help define Jurassic Park. It's no longer just a T-Rex. This is a Jurassic Park T-Rex. This is a Jurassic Park Raptor, so on and so forth. They put their stamp on these animals, and I mean quite literally with the toys because that's what you need to do to stand out from the crowd. You can't trademark a Velociraptor, but you can change it enough so when people think of that animal, they think of your property. So no, it's not one-on-one -on -one with the real animal, but these creators aren't idiots. Spielberg doesn't need you telling him how T-Rex eyeballs actually worked. They clearly knew what they were doing. So what am I getting at here? This isn't the movie apologist. Well, as far as the movie liberties are concerned, they make these dinosaurs easy to adapt for multiple situations. No matter if it's a bird's eye view or a side-scrolling adventure, whatever the case may be, you're gonna have to tackle these animals in practically the same way. The Dilophosaurus will always be a long distance projectile enemy. The Raptor will always be a pain in the ass if it's up close and personal. And if the T-Rex shows up, well, things just got real. It's a threat so large that the best thing to do is just run away or distract it while you make an escape. The only times you will ever face it directly is gonna be in a boss battle. And it's normally the last boss at that, being the ultimate challenge to conquer. The Jurassic Park games may be drastically different from one another, but the dinosaurs and their abilities are so well defined that you can plot them in any of these game styles and they'll work just fine. There are better platformers, there are better shooters, there are better adventure games out there. But if you love dinosaurs, if you love this movie, you'll be hard pressed not to find something to enjoy out of the set of games. And truth be told, I kinda prefer some of these games over the timeless classics they rip off. I know that's completely insane. Jurassic Park is not better than Doom, Zelda, or Myst. I understand how important those games are, how timeless, how brilliantly crafted, how well deserved of all the praise they may be. But some of them just don't speak to me. I'm just being honest with myself and honest with you guys. I just really like dinosaurs. I prefer to play an okay game featuring things that interest me than a great game that just bores me to tears. I mean, come on, honestly, I'm sure you can think of some cherished bits of media that you're simply not into or tired of hearing about. I understand how important Citizen Kane is to film, but I'd be happy never watching it again. It bored me to tears and that's okay. All of these timeless games get enough praise as it is and all of it is well-deserved, but damn it, I love dinosaurs and I wanted to play some dinosaurs dinosaur games, and I especially like them when I see some genuine care and ambition baked into the titles. I gotta respect how many different ways you can continue your adventure outside of this movie. I know they're just products for this multi-million dollar property, but I appreciate how much genuine care was put into all this merchandising around the main course. Almost all of these were good games for their time, and they still hold up surprisingly well, even in the face of all the modern conventions we expect from our games today. So maybe they're not the best of the best, but they could have easily gone the same way as so many other movie games. That is one big pile of shit. And as we look to future games in this series, we will find even stranger genres they dip their sickle claws into. But that's for another time. Point is, you have a lot of options when it comes to playing around with these dinosaurs. And I don't think you can really go wrong with whatever you choose. The next time we look at this franchise, we'll be popping over to Site B because, oh boy, there's a lot to talk about there. But our time in the park has come to a close for the day. I hope you had as much fun as I did. <laughs>